Welcome to the SBCA Podcast Component Connection. Looking at how businesses around the country are innovating to take advantage of opportunities in the construction supply chain. Now, here's your host, Sean Shields. Welcome, everyone. On today's podcast brought to you by the Structural Building Components Association and LMC, we are going to conclude our discussion with Shane Sewell, president of ProTech Panel and Trust in Bremen, Indiana. On this final episode, we are going to discuss why ProTech has pursued a path of product diversity and what they're doing within their manufacturing process to maximize efficiency and ultimately their profits. Shane, welcome back to the podcast. Sean, thanks for having me. It's been a, a pleasure discussing these these very fun uh, topics and look forward to um, this one as well. Well, Shane, I too have really enjoyed this discussion. Uh, I mean, we've, we've ranged on a lot of topics over the last two episodes, but you know, I feel like there's still a lot of ground to cover. And specifically in this episode, I want to talk about your long-term vision for your operations. As we discussed, you not only sell roof trusses, but also floor trusses, wall panels, floor cassettes or wall or floor panels, uh, engineered wood product, and windows and doors. I understand you also sort of want to increase your field labor capabilities too. I mean, what's the allure for you and for ProTech to be doing all of these things? You know, I, I really think that we've built houses the same way, you know, for the last 50 to, to 70 years. And we're at the, the precipice where, um, you know, just some of the younger generation and uh, mixed with um, technology advances and ultimately, you know, some more funding from, from the markets to, to really invest in changing the way we do things has um, really opened up, you know, our options to be able to change the normal process of, you know, shipping a bunch of sticks and dumping it in the yard and, you know, having the, the salesman visit the site with donuts, you know, that same old model we found, you know, just, just check the numbers. We're less efficient than we were 50 years ago while other industries, you know, are, are a thousand percent better than they were as they've just adopted new ways of doing things. So we want to be on the, the forefront of that. And we've built a team that's excited for doing things differently, for, you know, grasping the new technology that's out there, even down to, to BIM design, really working through just on the blueprint side of it. You know, we, we think that um, that's going to be changing quite a bit from, you know, the builder hiring an, a draft, draftsman to then give it to five lumber yards to, to then design the same truss package and then only one gets it and then recreate the whole thing and then the kitchen. You know, that, that's the type of, that's a microcosm for the type of things this industry does that's so inefficient, where if you bring in building information modeling and have one model that everyone works within and you do it one time, uh, we want to be a part of that. Um, and that's, you know, involves a bit of change in mindset. Also the jobs where it takes, you know, three to four weeks to frame and it's in all sorts of conditions. And then the dumpster gets, you know, refilled three or four times that's inefficient and affordable housing that we want to try to get to involves, you know, a lot less waste from materials to design time, to communication to ultimately try to get this same house up in a percentage of the time, which ends up meaning dollars and cents and, and ultimately a better product. So we want to be on the forefront of that. A lot of us have done this before and we're at the, the part of our career where we don't want to sell a two by four for 10 cents cheaper and then get the triangle there two days sooner. For us, we want to be a little bit different and on the forefront of kind of changing the industry. So along those lines, I mean, being on the forefront to you, that means offering all the different products and solutions that your customers need today to be more efficient. So it's, as we talked about in the last episode, panelizing their walls and potentially their floors. It's also, you know, getting all of their products and services from one entity, right? Just you guys, they don't have to go to like five different uh, entities to get that framework completed, right? Yeah, and that's um, you know from the the builders' perspective, builders after the two thousand eight two thousand nine decline, really they became more lean. They had less office people, less job site people, so they're doing more than ever, and it's more complex than ever. So we found that being able to um, offer a full package, but also the labor 
just the, you know, the few times that we've done that and, and have talked to our customers about it, they would love that. It's, um, it's less touch points. Their process is much simpler. They don't have to worry as much about talking to, you know, multiple different people and maybe solving arguments or deal with variances within um, those pieces. And then we can also become an extended part of their, their team as well. So they can stay lean and mean, and we can take on more of that field management and the framing stage that we do every single day. So what I think I'm hearing between the lines there, Shane, is the, the allure of adding the uh, installation piece, the field labor piece, is that you're already doing all of these things focused on making the job as easy as possible for the field labor. You might as well take advantage of all of that work by uh, passing that, that cost savings onto your own field labor and get, you know, sort of um, realizing the synergy between all of those different areas of operation overall, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a, a key point as well, because not only do you have to work on being efficient in the plant and then the framing crews have to work on being efficient at the job site, but how that handshake happens there's a ton of efficiency that's being lost, you know, so uh, material suppliers and trust suppliers may come up with a, a trailer full of stuff and dump it everywhere. You know, they built it in the most economical packages that fit on their trucks and as fast as they can with the least amount of banding to do it safely and just make it the framers problem where then the framer has to then take their very highly paid people and pull it all apart and then kind of get to the point where they can start putting the first nails in, where if you have that communication and say, how can we build these uh, bunks for you? How can we uh, help you in the factory by sheeting gables or nailing girders or building soffits, ladder soffits that you're up hanging on, you know, on rafters and all of these things, when the labor cost in the field is as high as it is, actually have that payback now because of the, the variance in cost of skilled labor from the factory to the field. But before that, that, that was much tighter. You could hire new people in the field and train them at a, a lower rate than you can now. People just don't want to go outside and work. So just to get people that will do work out in the elements, the labor cost is almost double in the field. So that's where it really, really starts to make sense. And, and it's really mature and open now for more advanced components to be sent out and ultimately make it economically feasible for that to happen. So, Shane, you know, we explored that concept quite a few times on this podcast, you know, the idea of a component manufacturer integrating, adding more of those pieces. <clears throat> and as you've said, you've really been focused on trying to have the field labor be as efficient as possible because of the, the labor rate that exists out there today. And that's not going to slide backwards. It's only going to become more of an issue. But you're a manufacturer first. This is still predicated on you being as efficient as you possibly can on the manufacturing side of things. Can we talk a little bit about, you know, how you approach optimizing your operations to sort of maximize the return on investment that you've made into the, the you know, the, the equipment that you have? Yes. And, um, you know, serving the field, like I said, um, doing some of these added value things do, do slow us down in the shop, but we can still be as efficient as we can with the scope of work we have in the factory. So we're always looking at that. And even though I was a consultant for a few year, years there, I've also learned that I don't know it all. And there a lot of people know a lot more than me. So we still bring in consultants, at least on a quarterly basis to, to walk our operation with us, give us ideas, um, look at our SOPs that we've written, watch our process, make suggestions. And then we expect ourselves to continually make changes, which ultimately come back to, you know, our rates and our efficiency in the shop, which we track very closely with, with KPIs and, you know, leverage our software to, to kind of tell us how long it should take something, not just looking at, at, at board footage rates. We look at man minutes and really try to dial those in and really get into the details of what our true costs are and our opportunities for growth. So it's, it's one thing to serve the field, but you can still do that as efficiently as you can in the shop. And it's, it's a twofold thing. So of course we want to be more efficient for the framers, but we can still do that efficiently in house. And that's keeping a, a very open mind to that. And frankly, you can't figure it all out yourself. So really, um, getting other people to come in, I can't say enough about bringing in consultants within our industry to help give you a different look at, at how you're doing things. So 
You're pouring a lot of effort into gathering data about how are you doing? How long is this taking us? How efficient are we being? Where do we have opportunities to be more efficient? You're, you're also looking at your true costs, right? So in tracking all that stuff, you're gathering a lot of information, spending a lot of time and resources to gather the information to know how much is this actually costing us. So you're pouring all of that effort into being more efficient, but you're also open to the idea of like robotics. So as somebody who is deep in the numbers all the time, help me understand sort of your perspective on robotics. Why do you see that as a, a good place to go to next? Really, when I'm looking at, at opportunities, I first try to start with a very simple question. Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? And robotics absolutely makes sense when we have a labor shortage. Um, and then ultimately, there are many things that robots can do exactly the same over and over. And we still are manufacturing. We are still are making widgets that are supposed to be the exact plotted out way. So... I believe that robotics are the future. I don't necessarily believe in fully going to a robotic shop yet. I still think there's a lot of things to figure out, but the idea of bringing in single robotic arms to do repetitive things within the plants absolutely is going to be a part of the future. If it's you know a robot that picks plates and stages them, um, a robot that takes any cords that need spliced from floors or roofs and pre-splices them and stages them. Those types of things, I think the cost of robotics has, is dropping and will continue to drop where the, the, the payback is going to be there. And again, uh, I'm a big fan of skilled labor, even with all of the technology and, you know, automated pucks and lasers, you still need people to, you know, work with lumber that's imperfect and think and, and jump in there. But there are a lot of repetitive tasks that frankly, a lot of people don't want to do that can be done with a, a good payback from robotics. So that's something that we anticipate we'll have a robot in here within the next um, two to three years. That's an interesting progression, Shane, when you talk about it. So what we've talked about over the last couple of, of episodes is, is really this shift from what I would say before the, the last recession was, if you want to build more houses, you just throw more bodies on the job site to get it done, right? Just more people swinging hammers. And there's definitely been a dramatic shift away from that where you've mentioned multiple times, like the labor shortage on the job site and the rate at which the field labor needs to be paid to show up and work outside every day has dramatically shifted that equation. And what you you are essentially representing is a shift of the labor burden to the component manufacturing plant. But what you just pointed out is that unlike on the job site where it's like, well... <laughs> Every job site is wholly unique and different. Robotics just don't make a lot of sense there. But in a component manufacturing space, you can do all of the a lot of the field labor work, and you can replace some of that with robotics that can do the repetitive work over and over again, and you can realize cost savings that way. I mean, ultimately, is that what you're selling? Yes. And like I said, it's um, skilled labor is, is going up. People that want to do repetitive things, you know, safely and at a very high level of consistency and quality, it's harder and harder to come up with. You know, robotics, you used to think, you know, if I bought a robot, it'd be half million, a million dollars. Well, that's hard to get a payback on that. But when robotics start to say, okay, we can get, we can get a single robotic arm for a hundred thousand, then you start to look at uh, payback numbers that make sense. And then it's just a lot easier for shop supervisors um, to manage a portion of the employees and, and really point them towards more skilled things. And then the unskilled side of things, um, just have it ultimately take care of itself. One, one less thing you have to deal with that's the same every single day and is becoming more and more affordable. So I just don't want to be one of those people that say that will never work because unfortunately our industry has a lot of people that say that. And now is the time that can really come back and bite you if you're not open-minded to changes and opportunities in, in what the industry is doing. So I just don't want to get left behind a fear of a failure, uh, a fear of being left behind with, you know, all the different companies buying each other out. If you have to compete primarily on buying better and selling for a nickel cheaper, you know, our days are numbered. So I want to think forward and be more nimble and have an advantage over um, the much larger companies. Shane, thank you so much for being on this podcast. 
a huge fan. I've, I've listened to every episode and um, learned a lot from it. And it's, it's just an honor to be one of the people that have worked here with you. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please give this podcast a favorable rating and share it with others. Also, consider subscribing to SPCA's Component Connection podcast on whatever platform you use most. That way, you'll immediately know when we publish our next podcast. This has been a Component Connection podcast brought to you by SBCA. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover in a future episode, send it to podcast at sbcacomponents.com.